Hello, and welcome back to the Ask the Color Expert podcast. Today's special guest is John Palmieri. He is a lifetime hairdresser, co-owner of 124Go, a business and leadership coaching for salon owners to re-energize growth. He is the co-host of the Shop Talk podcast, and he also just dropped on me before we started, but he is the Director of Business Development for six salons and a school. I don't know about you, but I am exhausted by just (laughs) reading you his bio. Mm -hmm. So thank you, John, for carving time out of all that madness to be with me today. Well, thankfully, I'm looking forward to it. This will be fun. So you probably don't realize it, but you and I go way back to Mm -hmm. your strategies days. You came to the Art of Business in Philadelphia. And that was always my injection shot in the arm motivation. Every single year that I've owned my business, I always look forward to that. So you were there on behalf of strategies and I was impressed then. And I am even more impressed now with all of the things you've added to your very um, large resume, including, I didn't mention in your uh, bio, the John Maxwell training. I love all things John Maxwell. And um, I'm sure that that's a big part of the foundation of who you are as a coach. Um, So talk to me about that, about the filtering the John Maxwell stuff in for us hairdressers that, you know, some people listening may not even know who John Maxwell is. Well, you know, I had owned my own salon for, you know, 25 years. And when I first started that salon, one of the challenges was, you know, growing it. I I knew what I knew. I knew how to cut hair. I knew how to make people laugh. Um, Yet somewhere along the line, it became important to actually grow a business and make some money. And one of the things that I realized is that I didn't know what I didn't know. And that's how we met at Strategies, because we were able to, you know, make that connection um, in regards to how do we grow a company and beyond just being friendly and being, you know, a nice person. So to answer your question, one of the things that became really apparent is that leadership and finance are kind of like the two pillars all companies fall and rise on, right? You either have really strong leadership or you don't, you're really strong with your finances or you're not. And so John Maxwell fits that, that first part, it fits that leadership piece. And, you know, I love everything he has to say. It's great content. He's a great person to work with. And, you know, John Maxwell says, um, leadership is influence. And I'd like that because it keeps it real simple. You know, I think sometimes we make leadership more complicated than it needs to be. And yet what I liked about John Maxwell is he made it real simple. Your ability to influence people, which is different from telling people what to do, is completely different. And, you just and I took like the that words right out of my mouth. The first thing I thought of when you said that was myself as a salon owner for 33 years, it took me until year 30, literally, to understand the difference between exactly what you just said, Mm -hmm. being a boss and being a leader. Two different things. Yeah, I tended to be a mother figure of Mm -hmm. my own doing. I wasn't aware of it at all. Nobody would ever do that on purpose, but it's the way that I was always raised as like, it's easier to do it myself. It's easier to, you know, say, do it this way and not, have that buy-in and that engagement of the staff. Um, And again, you know, three years before my exit is when I finally understood it. And it's great for my daughter because Mm -hmm. she's there now with this amazing culture because I'm no longer there. So when you take mom out of that dynamic, it could have been really bad where the whole thing could have fallen apart, but because she has learned from my mistakes and listening to my shoulda, coulda, would'ves. Um, We both were trained as life coaches. We both understand boundaries and all those things that I didn't understand before. So she came in right off the bat as a totally different and 100% a leader. She Mm -hmm. led them through the COVID madness. They trusted her. She guided them through everything. I am so proud of her. And it's almost worth all the scars that I have to see Right. That she actually gets it. You know, mm-hmm. my son's the same way. Like they get it. When you see somebody going through making those mistakes, you can't help but really have those aha moments and say, well, I don't want to do that. Right. So I'm going to do this. Well, I think one of the th- challenges that comes is people will like to think that they can be a great leader right off the bat. And that, you know, that's pretty rare. That I don't even think that it really even happens. 
uh, the sooner you start on that journey though, and kind of like you know, what you just referenced, it took me 30 years to get here, right? The sooner you start, the better you get. And so your son and your daughter, you're right, they were able to, to benefit from watching you go through that challenge and watching you learn sometimes the hard way, sometimes you know the, the great benefits and the victories that you had along the way. Um, but yeah, the sooner you start on that journey, the better because you're gonna make mistakes that's okay. You learn from them. You become a better leader. Yeah. And you had said um, early on, it's the, the financial piece and the leadership mm-hmm. piece. Right. And I think it's safe to say that most hair salon owners were amazing hairdressers who said, I can do this. I want my own place. I want to control the music, the atmosphere, the, mm-hmm. you know, the temperature, like it's the control freak in me that wanted to be an owner, not the business person that I wasn't. And still, I don't find myself to be really good at finances and structure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think as really good hairdressers, we think if we just are really kick ass behind the chair and we just keep doing better and better and better, that it's going to be that trickle down effect where our staff is going to see us as a role model and emulate what we're doing. And the finances are just going to work themselves out. And I think that the leadership part and the financial part, thank God for people like you and Chris, and is it Brian, did you say as your third right. partner? Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, thank God for the three of you, because when you're a stylist, you know, what comes to you on Facebook ads or Instagram or whatever, it's come to this hair painting class, come to this class, you know, and learn this technique, but it's so rare that someone actually says, I am you, I've been you, you know, you're, Mm -hmm. you're currently facilitating six salons and a school. You Mm -hmm. have to have a really tough skin to be able to do that. And a lot of experience. So do you find as a coach for me, as a hair color coach, my Mm -hmm. biggest frustration is when people say, how do I do this? And I say, step one, step two, step three. And then I check back in and say, how did it go? And they say, well, I didn't do any of that. I did this. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, so you hired a coach because you needed help, but now you're not trying any of the new ways you're doing it your old way. Mm-hmm. So how difficult is that for you as a coach to get that movement and trust going early on in the relationship where you don't find yourself frustrated? I think that there is a difference between leadership and financial coaching and technical coaching. And I find the same thing on a technical end. You know, I'll walk through one of our salons, I'll see one of our newer level stylists and I'll offer them a suggestion, right? Hey, try this, try that. Hey, those spoils a little too close. Try balayage like this, paint it this way, blah, 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 blah. One of the first things that I often hear is John cuts hair, (laughs) right? (laughs) Because they don't see me as that person, right? They see me as the guy who takes care of leadership programs and deals with the financial issues that we have that I get a lot more of the, oh, if I check back in a week, did you try that? Oh, no, I did it like this. And I did it like that. And I think that's because we have enough information to be dangerous, right? And I think that hands-on experience, people want to get in there. They won't do it maybe the first time you did it. Maybe they'll do it the second time when it fails. And they realize, you know what? Maybe Elaine did know what she was talking about. On the finance and leadership side, I, more often than not, not always, but more often than not, it's the opposite. And I think it's because people don't have a good understanding of finance and they don't have a good understanding of leadership. So they're all ears at that point. It's almost mm-hmm. like I know nothing about either of these two things. So I'll take what you have to say. So from mo- most, I don't want to paint the world with too wide of a brush, but I say 90% of the people we work with on the business and le- leadership side are very open to coaching and follow through. 20% on a technical side are much more willing to ignore you, or excuse me, do it their own way, 80% will ignore you. Um, Because they think, you know, if I just get my hands in it, and if I just get my hands in it and play with it a little little bit longer, I'll figure it out. Um, And that's, as we all know, isn't really true. You need a little bit of help. The financial part to me is so stressful because we just lost my dad and my Mm. mom fortunately was very involved Mm. with doing the books and and all the financial stuff together. So she's not, she's far from a damsel in distress, but they Mm. both were a little bit old school as far as how they ran their investments and stuff like that. They're very leery of advisors and people trying to tell them what to do with their money. But 
But because of that, they probably didn't get the growth potential that mm -hmm. they could have had. Mm -hmm. So now with estate planning, I keep saying, mom, get with someone who really knows what they're doing because there's a lot of advantage of doing it different ways. Mm -hmm. And because I'm so kind of tuned into that right now and, and the finances, I was doing some invoicing for my own business. And I said to my husband, because I told you, I'm really not into the financial part of it. I kind of just like, okay, is, is there money? I can go out to eat. I can go on vacation. I'm good. Right. Um, so I, I poked my head out of my office and I said, does it make a difference? The event that the, they're paying for is in March. So is it advantageous for me to build them in January versus now from a tax right. perspective? Yep. And he kind of looked at me like, I don't know. And I was like, I don't know either. But these are the things that as a hairdresser, we're so head down in the grind of doing, right. doing, doing that there could be something as little as that, as like, mm -hmm. you know, ordering a big order of color January 1 versus mm -hmm. December 29th. That for me, that seems so overwhelming when I was right. in the salon to even pick my head up to even ask a question about that. And you know how accountants are. They tell you how wonderful they're going to be. And they're only going to do what you ask them to do. They're not going to call you and say, Hey, Elaine, if you have a big purchase, you know, this is where you are this year. Don't make it until January one. It'll benefit you from a tax bracket. Like I have no idea the answer yeah. to that question. So how involved do you get in that nitty gritty of coaching us Salon owners that find ourselves too busy to pay attention to those details. Well, there's a lot there. So this, this will take a minute if that's okay. I always have four layered questions. That's okay. Well, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm doing this more for your benefit because I can talk a lot. Um, one of the things I think is really important is one of the intents of coaching, at least in my opinion, one of the intents of good financial coaching is I don't have those licenses. I got a lot of licenses, but one of them is not financial planning. And I'm not an accountant and I make a pretty good bookkeeper though. Uh, but that's only because I did my own once upon a time. I think what's really important is, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit, is we have our head down and we're trying to work and we're grinding it out and we're really busy working. And we know we don't know anything about finance or at least not much. And so when we visit our accountant or we visit our bookkeeper, there's a little bit of fear there. We don't know what questions to ask. We don't want to sound stupid or ignorant. We got a little bit of pride. Um, and so we don't make the progress that we need to make. And, and that's a challenge in itself. Be, having that fear, having a little bit of pride, not wanting to come across as stupid, not wanting to just not ask the right questions because we don't even know if they're questions that make sense. You know, I often joke about the folks who get their quarterly tax you know, statements or the quarterly tax returns in those brown envelopes. And I bet you if I go into your office, there's a pile of them on a file cabinet in the back room because we don't even open them, right? Our intent with financial education is to get you to a point where you ask better questions. Now you don't feel stupid. Hey, I made $60,000 in profit last year. Where is it, right? Um, Hey, what's depreciation? I don't even know what the heck that thing is. And it's on my profit and loss statement. What do you mean I went to the bank and asked for a loan and they won't give me any money? How come? They say, because I don't have the cash flow to sustain that. What are you talking about? I got plenty of money in the bank until payday comes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so our intent with financial education is to teach you enough so that when you get the profit and loss statement, you can read it and then say, okay, this is what it tells me. My coaching says that these are the action steps I need to take. I call it self auditing. I want you to be able to look at your profit and loss statement and go, oh, I know what I need to do. Now let the accountant and bookkeeper do the math. That's what you pay them for. But get those statements, read them over, have a basic understanding of what they're telling you and what they mean. And then you get to go back and say to your accountant, hey, for instance, should I buy this stuff in January or should I, should I wait till, you know, should I have bought it in December before the year ended? You know, should I do this before tax day or after tax day? Um, and we don't know the ask of those questions because we don't know the first part, which is how to read your three basic financial documents, which are profit and loss statements, statement of cash flow, and your balance sheet. And yes, you need all three because all three tell you something different. But once you know what each one tells you, you can look at them self-audit and it's not making your own decisions. 
And that's where we really want people to be. Coaching shouldn't be, you shouldn't need me forever, right? Sooner or later, I want to teach you, what is the old saying? I'm going to teach you how to fish mm -hmm. so that you can feed yourself. Our goal is let's teach you how to read your financial statements. You'll be able to self-audit and ask your financial people better questions. So as you just answered that, I'm mm -hmm. sitting here listening to you and I'm picturing someone just fell off the treadmill. Someone yeah. just drove off the side of the road because what's happening in our industry majorly across the board is a lot of people are fleeing to solo suites and mm -hmm. they right now just spit out their coffee and said, what profit and yeah. loss mm -hmm. quarterly tax things. What the mm -hmm. heck is all that? I just went into a suite because I want to keep all of the money. Yeah. And, you know, I have my little app on my phone and the money goes in there and I just get to keep it all right. Mm -hmm. So what happened during COVID um, COVID was really sucky. We can all agree on that, but there were yeah. so many good things that came out of it because so many people were in categories that were not correct as far as payroll and taxes and all of the things. And people really got hurt by it because mm -hmm. they were considered self-employed when they didn't know they were self-employed. They didn't right. understand what a 1099 was and they mm -hmm. weren't getting the assistance that the government was trying to give them because they weren't signed up correctly to begin with. So mm -hmm. I'm sure you're finding a lot of really um, scared hairdressers that are like, where do I even begin to make this right? Because right. I just didn't know. It's it's the old, you know, you don't know what you don't know kind of thing. Yeah. In the last several months, we probably hired within our company, I think five or six people who came from uh, Booth Rental came come to work for us. And, you know, while I love drawing new people in the door, um, it's sad at the same time, right? We're not taught financial literacy in the schools. We're not taught how to, you know, ask the questions that need to be asked of our accountant. Accountants, you know, we have, we're working with this accountant right now. His name is Chris Peden. I'm going to name drop just for a minute because I like him so much. And one of the things that Chris has told me, he goes, even the accounting world has changed because yeah. so much of the stuff can be done online now. There's TurboTax, there's QuickBooks, a lot of salon owners can do their own bookkeeping and get a lot of that done. So what do I need an accountant for except at the end of the year to do my tax returns? And so accountants have learned that they need to be advocates for the business. There is a, there is a change amongst the um, profession of accounting where we have to be business advocates. We have to get more involved. We, as you said, you know, I'm not going to offer you any information. I'll answer your questions. Well, now that's even they are understanding that needs to change because there's too much online that can basically take their jobs away. Um, right. Where's where's the real value? The real value is being able to ask questions, get some feedback, get some tips on how to cut your taxes. You know, what can, what's a better way to, you know, spend your money? Um, so COVID not only has changed our industry, but it's changed people like accountants, which you think, wouldn't be a thing, right? But absolutely. It is. Yeah. Is it is it Larry Oskin Oskin? Yeah. Is he the accountant that's always at the beauty shows? Yes. Um, you know, same thing. Here's a guy who's been doing this forever, right? Now, here's the thing. I know I don't know Larry personally, but what I do know is he's been doing adv advocate work for years. Like he he caught on to this idea that you've actually got to get out in the field and help people and offer information and offer support before they come to you. Yeah. Uh, and so he, I think he was always kind of ahead of that curve, right? I love that he was um, geared towards our industry because I can't mm -hmm. tell you, I've only had two accountants in 33 years. So that's mm -hmm. pretty good. I've had some good support, but mm -hmm. they don't really understand our business. Sometimes no. they compare it to other businesses. And mm -hmm. one of the things that Larry pointed out that really made an impact on my business, and I think is going to shock some people listening, is gift certificate sales. Right. You know, I would go to class after not class in business. <laughs> yeah. I was like, hell no, do not buy a gift certificate from me. You know, mm -hmm. people would say, oh, you can generate so much income in the fourth quarter with gift certificate sales. And that's a big boost in your business. I'm like, uh-uh. Yeah. If people ask for them, I sell them to them. Mm -hmm. But I had to instruct my accountant from what I learned from his class Right. to make that almost like a separate account of money that isn't even real. Right. Separate because, bank account. Where you yeah, it's pulling into it. the next year. That was yeah. huge. But that's one thing. Yeah. So you can just imagine how many others 
Um, well, it depends but we're on not really paying attention to. Yeah, it depends on your state too. You know, I like selling gift certificates, so let, uh, let me start there. Yet we did a really good job of managing those, right? So if we sold thirty thousand dollars worth of gift cards over the holidays, I took that thirty thousand dollars and I put it in the bank. I wasn't touching it. And one of the reasons, and you alluded to this, is gift certificates are not your money. It's a loan. It's a yeah. lane coming in and saying, I'm going to give you, John, $100 now, but I'm going to come back and get it later. And you're like, well, what do you mean you're going to come back and get it later, John? Well, what I'm telling you is Elaine's going to come in. She's going to get a haircut, $100 haircut, because uh, you know, you're really good. $50 of that goes to the stylist. And if you've already spent that money, you don't have the money to pay the stylist because you went and spent that 30 grand. So if you redeem a thousand dollars worth of gift cards this month, you go to that savings account, you take that thousand out, you put it into your general fund, and now you can pay your team. Too often what happens around the middle of the year, we're in this cash crunch because for the last four, five, six months, customers have been cashing in those gift cards that we already spent the money on. It's yeah. not your money. It's a loan and people come back and they want that money back. They get it back in services and that costs you payroll, that costs you supply costs, that costs you the retail they buy with it. So I like gift cards because to me, they're a retention tool, right? Mm -hmm. I know you're going to come back. So I like them, but only if they're managed well. If you don't manage them well, to your point, Elaine, you're almost better off not doing them. Yeah, because the other piece is if a stylist leaves, yep. either because they're staying home with their children or they went to another salon, then you have the droves of people calling and saying, well, I have a gift card and I want my money back or mm -hmm. I want to come in and buy jewelry or a hairbrush or something right. like that. And then you're really bleeding mm -hmm. out because, you know, that was not the intent of the, it was as a retention tool. So right. yeah. um, the other thing that I learned that way was bridal. Mm -hmm. bridal parties you know we used to be so catering to bridal parties and we started to realize when we really dug into the numbers we were such a strong color salon that when a bridal party came and took up the whole entire salon on a saturday right eight out of ten of the people in there were from out of state mm -hmm. that weren't going to be future clients mm -hmm. and those were visits that we could have had a client getting a root retouch that then is going to come every five weeks from that day so we finally were like bridal party. No, this, this isn't a moneymaker. This is, this is bad for us, you know, but everybody's different, but anybody listening, I'm sure will be like, oh my gosh, I never even thought to look at that. Um, mm -hmm. People don't think about looking at tweaking their schedule. You know, mm -hmm. we've gotten locked into this hairdressers work Tuesday through Saturday, oh, right. you know, Friday night's the big night, Saturday's mm -hmm. the big day. Our Friday nights, we're out of there by six o'clock. It's our shortest day. Mm -hmm. We're closed on Saturdays. We're open on Mondays. Monday's our busiest day because yep. all the other salons are closed. So I've always been one of those rebels, the purple cow, the outside yep. the box girl, where I was like, I don't want to be here on Saturday. My staff mm -hmm. doesn't want to be on Saturday. And the worst of all, the client didn't want to be there. Right. We were finding ourselves trying to talk clients into a Saturday at three appointment. That was like in the middle of their day. They're off from work. They have other things to do. So once we started really digging in and just saying, what are we doing? We don't want to be here. Client doesn't want to be here. Staff doesn't want to be here. Why are we here? Let's do it different. Right. Well, because we think that that's how it used to be. And so that's what we think still needs to happen. And that's still not true. Right. And I think now if COVID didn't happen, there would still be people do, I can't tell you how many people have made complete career changes because of COVID, moved mm -hmm. to other states, um, gone into a totally different direction in their business, um, retired completely, um, divorces. I'm talking to a lot of people that are getting divorces because I oh. think it was a whole lot of togetherness that they right. weren't Just a little too used much. to. Yeah. 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 We've had, of all the new hires, we've had, I think, 20... 22 new hires in the last three months, which is a lot for us. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I think six of those came from out of state. Uh, one from Los Angeles, one from Florida, one from uh, Tennessee, one from North Carolina. Those are ones I can, top, I can think of off the top of my head. Um, but the same thing. I want to change. You know, I, I, I don't know what I want. I just know I don't want this anymore. Right. And they change. 
Um, and that provides opportunities, I think, for well-run, well-established businesses. If you have that leadership piece and you have that finance piece nailed down, you're attractive to people because they, a lot of people want, I think a lot of people want structure. You know, we talk about people leaving the salons and opening up their own suites and their own, their own booths. And you know what, that I'm that person, I'm entrepreneurial by nature. I want to start my own thing. When I came, when I sold my salon and moved to Georgia, um, I went to work with Brian Purdue and that's been great, but I still needed my own thing. So, you know, we started the consulting company. It's how I'm wired, right? And you're never going to replace that. That's one of the benefits of this industry is you get to be that entrepreneur. But too many of our stylists and estheticians and massage therapists leave our salons, not necessarily because of that, but because leadership is poor and they, nobody's telling them or taking the time to teach them how to be financially lucrative behind the chair. Um, if you can accomplish those two things, you'll keep a lot more people than, than you would think, right? Because they want the structure. There are people who go, you know, one of the, we had a girl that, you know, left our salon about a year and a half ago and she went to rent a suite. Great employee, loved her to death. It was just where she was in her life. And, and I get that. But when she posted on Instagram, a picture of herself in the kitchen on a Friday night folding foils, right? It was amazing how many people from the salon posted, I don't want that. You know, that's not the life I want to live. Uh, you make, you, you make, you change one thing for another. And that's not me advocating one over the other. That's me saying that as a salon owner, if you want to keep your team and you want to keep more of your staff, you won't keep them all because we all have our paths, but you'll keep a lot more if it can become a leader and not a boss. And if you can teach them and yourself how to be a better financially run company so that everybody wins. You accomplish those two things, you'll keep a lot more of your staff a lot longer than you would otherwise. Absolutely. And you said earlier that, you know, a lot of the financial piece doesn't get covered in mm -hmm. our schooling. And right. you and I have had many conversations of how we feel about the foundational piece of strong mentorship, guidance, all of that. Now, with you having the opportunity to be, you know, a director in a school, do mm -hmm. you ever see the school model adapting to 2021 and beyond of what really needs to happen? Or is there still so much red tape at the government level that you still will not have the time to be able to um, provide that. I think that as far as high school, mm -hmm. college, every part of education, I feel right. like that's the last place that COVID has really kicked people in the ass. And that's the mm -hmm. first place that it's needed. Um, you know, we can get on our phone right now and say, what's the capital of Georgia? What's sure. the capital of, you know what I mean? Like anything we want to know, mm -hmm. these kids are still memorizing. They're still going through the motions of a, of a system that's so antiquated in both mm -hmm. the lower levels, the high school levels, the college levels, and of course the trades as well. Well, I think that, you know, I want to make this really clear in all industries, not just ours, all industries, people get a little lazy, right? We fall back on systems and processes that have worked forever. We like them. They're comfortable. Why rock the boat? Schools are the same way. Now, I used to be the director of education for our school, so you can add that to my resume too. <laughs> um, when I was at the school, one of the things I learned, because you know, hairdressers like to complain about the students coming out of the school, right? One of the things I know in the state of Georgia, you have 1,500 hours in order to become a master cosmetology. Each one of those 1,500 hours is mandated as to what can happen with them. 250 of those hours need to be hair cutting. 350 of those hours need to be hair color. 100 of those hours need to be sanitation. 200 of those hours have to be customer service skills. So you are mandated. But here's the part, so that's the thing. But here's what, here's the other thing. They don't tell you how those 250 hours in hair cutting have to be delivered. They just say you need 250 hours of hair cutting. They don't tell you, you need to spend 100 hours, you know, working at customer service skills and you need to cover this. Right. So there is flexibility in the program, even though we do have the mandates as well. All of that is to say that, you know, one of the things I do is I still visit the school and I teach uh, business and leadership development at the school. And one of the things we cover is in, in the sophomore phase, 
which means they've been in the school for eight weeks now, about 250, 300 hours. I teach them how to read a profit and loss statement as sophomores. I love that. Right? I love that. So, and not only do I teach them how to read a profit and loss statement, I teach them how to read a profit and loss statement for a commission salon. I teach them how to read a profit and loss statement for a booth rental or suite environment. And I teach them how to read a profit and loss statement for a team-based pay um, location. And I tell them the same thing I'm going to share with you. My intent is not to tell you which of the three you should work in because they all three business models fit a certain type of person. My goal is I'm going to give you as much information as possible. You figure out which one you want to work in. But now you can go out with a lot more information in your head and make a better decision rather than walking in a building in a mu music school, you know, um, because that only lasts so long. If I can teach a bunch of fresh, uh, excuse me, sophomores how to read three profit and loss statements in a span of about four hours, we can do it too, meaning the owners and the leaders of our salon. It's not that hard, it's just different. And so I say to schools, you know, I understand the mandates. I've been part of that network. I know what it looks like. But there's enough flexibility within that mandate for you to create a curriculum that answers some of those questions. Not a lot of room, but there is some room. I love that because anytime I say, you know, how frustrated I am with, with what happens in the time that they're in school, I get a lot of backlash from teachers in schools. And they say, it's not our fault. We're told what to do and how to do it and all that. And I'm like, well, who's the guy we have to talk to about what they're told to do? Like there has to be some level of change to make it where the, the brand new person out of school doesn't then have to start down the rabbit trail of how do I really learn how to do hand paint at highlights? How do I really learn how to formulate? How do I really learn how to have customer service and good, you know, people skills? Right. Um, so it has to, it has to be at some level, there has to be major change. I've seen it with both of my kids. I think I'm one of very few moms that begged my kids not to go to college. Sure. <laughs> both of them. Mm -hmm. And both of them, and I say it often on this podcast, so if people are listening, they've probably heard it a million times. Mm -hmm. They both got an amazing offer from me mm -hmm. to forego college mm -hmm. and that I would let them take a, an entire year between high school and when they would have gone to college that first year, mm -hmm. completely fund it by me to oh. do anything they want to do, That's travel awesome. anywhere they want to go in the world. And I'm talking flights, meals, accommodations, every expense. Because to me, when you're leaving high school, you have no idea who you are. You have no idea what you want to do. You think in fourth grade, you're like, oh, I want to be a nurse or I want to be a teacher, you know, all those blanket things. Right. And you don't really know who you are. And then that's the age that you get into your first serious relationship. And because you don't know who you are, now you've picked a real winner with the person that you're with. Right. And most times it's a disaster because you didn't take time to do the self reflection and self-discovery. So I knew in my heart that that was a great plan for my kids. What I didn't factor in is, yeah, I'm, I, at the time I was, you know, in my late forties. So of course I'm confident enough to travel by myself for a year, but when you're sure. 18, mm -hmm. not so much, you want to do what all your friends are doing. Right. Both kids fast forward now, 23 and 28. Oh my God, I'm an idiot. Why did I not <laughs> take that deal? Cause this is where the deal got better. I said, I believe oh, so they in didn't, education. They didn't take the deal. They went they to didn't college. They didn't take the deal. They went to college. Yeah. And the deal was, if at the end of that year, you decide that what you want to do for a living requires a college education, I will mm -hmm. still pay for your college. This isn't and or, I mean, sure. or if, if and. Um, I'll still pay for your college education because if you took that time to soul search, now that I know how it turns out, I don't right. need the crystal ball. Neither mm -hmm. of them need a college to do mm -hmm. what they're doing. And they're happy sure. doing what they're doing. That's and awesome. I knew that you mm -hmm. raise your kids, you know, you mm -hmm. said it earlier about being an entrepreneur. Both of my kids are entrepreneurs. There's no yeah. way they're ever going to be happy working for the man and showing up and punching a time <laughs> clock. Right. And I knew that, but you can't, you know, you, you can yeah. only, you know, make the offers, but you can't make them do it. So That's awesome. I've always been again, that purple cow book totally resonated with me because life is too short to be, you know, following what everybody else is doing. It's really crowded mm. when things are normal and, and acceptable. It's the really right. crowded space. You know, when, when we go to Disney, I say to my kids, 
take the left lane. They're like, why? I'm like, because everybody Everybody goes right. right. And we, and they just giggled because they would watch people scrambling to go right. And they're like, how did you know that? (laughs) Well, one of the things I think that's really important, and I think hairdressers are, are, are attuned to this, although we need to expand on it a little bit more. And that is we're really good at getting self, self knowledge, right? I mean, we're really, we'll take it, we'll go on a plane and fly to Las Vegas, go learn how to cut bobs, right? We'll go and see somebody and learn all about balayage techniques, right? We'll go to Boston and we'll learn all about, you know, a, a new perm technique or new, or, or new something. We're really good at self-educating ourselves. Oh, I think what's important is we need to ex- remember that we can expand that beyond hairdressing. You know, we have the basic skill set. We're good at self being self-taught, but you know what? Go learn how to do QuickBooks. You can do it online, right? If for no other reason to keep track of your own books. You know what? John Maxwell's programs are online. Um, you can learn how to be a better leader. And if not, John Maxwell is a host of other people out there that you can learn how to be a better leader for. I ended up working for a consulting company early in my hairdressing career because I needed the knowledge. You know, I needed to understand what good leadership and what good finance looked like. I, and then when I did, I was like, this is fun. I want to, I want to teach other people. And that turned into another gig. You know, it, there's always more to learn and, and there's so much available online, locally. You don't have to get on a plane and go anywhere. Um, you know, you and I are connecting across a Zoom call right now. Um, just think different. And that difference is whatever you want to learn, you can find it. You can find it online and a lot of it's free or so inexpensive it isn't even funny. Um, go learn. Figure it out. Be the inquisitive person that you as a hairstylist have naturally anyways. I love that. And that's the perfect way to wrap up this conversation and saying, how can people find more of you and what it is that you're doing? I know you have a new program coming out that I'm very excited about. So how can people reach you? And on so, on social on? media, you can find on all platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, I'm no indoor voice. So one word, no indoor voice. I'm on all social media platforms. As that person, DM me anytime. Um, You can also visit our website at 124go.com. You can check us out. We have, you're right. We have this new program called the Salon Business Blueprint. It's a video series that's, um, I I think, handsomely priced is the word I'll use because I like using the word handsome in a sentence. (laughs) It's handsomely priced. But it's a video series and it's the same thing we were just talking about. It talks about leadership. It talks about developing culture, finance, and how to get better behind the chair. It's got Brian, myself, and Chris in a, I think we got 28 videos. And it's a nice online course that you can take to refine your skills. Um, So that's how you can find us and and stay in contact. I love that. Thank you so much, John. It's always a pleasure. We could could have a three-hour podcast when when we get going. So. Thank you for your time and thank you everybody for listening. We will see you on the next one. Thanks, Elaine.